Good morning. I am Pastor Paul Santarude of Blair Lutheran Church, and this is... I'm Pastor Adam Ahrens. I serve at North Beaver Creek Lutheran Church. You may want to take a moment now to gather elements for communion, which we will lead later in this service. So take some time to gather some bread and some wine or juice, so that when we offer communion, you may partake yourself uh, with those in your household and with the body of Christ united around the world. Welcome to God's Church on this, the first Sunday of Lent. These communities of faith have one great aim and purpose, and that is to help people grow in life-giving relationships with their neighbor, with their self, with the earth, and with God. That's why we've come together, and that's why we're glad you're here. Let us remember that we are in the holy presence of God, and let's take a moment to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour Pour out out your your mercy mercy over us. us. Our Our sin sin is heavy. heavy. And we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the Spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace by the saving love of Jesus Christ the wisdom and power of God. Your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the unity of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. For the reign of God and for peace throughout the world. 
for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. For your people here who have come to give you praise, for the strength to live your word, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Help, save, and defend us, O God. Let us pray. Loving God, let me die in your arms. I am your child. Take me up in your loving hands and wash me clean of all that I have been so that I might be made new. In your love, I shed my illusions. I surrender my desires. I offer you my broken heart. Forgive me and heal me. Draw me close to you and hold me where I can truly become myself. Create in me a clean heart, a newborn spirit. Write your love on my soul. I die in your mercy. I surrender my life to you so that I may have your life alone and rise to bear the fruit of your love. Amen. Amen. Our first reading today is from the book of Genesis, the ninth chapter. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between you, between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I set my bow in the clouds. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember. The everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our psalm for this morning is Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Rather, let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Show, Show me your, your ways, ways, O Lord, and teach, teach me your paths. paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember, O, Remember, Lord, o Lord, your compassion, your compassion and, and love, love for, for they, they are from, from everlasting. everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth, and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. You are, you are gracious, gracious and upright, upright O Lord. Lord. Therefore, Therefore you teach sinners, sinners in, your in your way. You lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. All, All your, your paths, paths, O Lord, Lord are steadfast, steadfast love and faithfulness to those who keep your covenant, your covenant and your, your testimonies. testimonies. Our second reading is from 1 Peter, chapter 3. Christ also suffered for sins once for all, 
the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Return to the Lord your God, for he is patient and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Our gospel for today, for this first Sunday in Lent, is from Mark, the first chapter. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice from heaven came from heaven and said, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the gospel of the Lord. Holy God, Give us grace to open our hearts and minds to hear your true and living word, Jesus the Christ, who will transform our lives. Amen. (laughs) Baptism, temptation in the desert, John is arrested, Jesus proclaims, bam, 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 Mark lays out the backstory for Jesus' arrival onto the scene. Very little detail. Let's get to the main part of the story as quickly as possible. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Hmm. Well, Lent is here. That solemn time for preparation. And we take 40 days to prepare ourselves. Fasting, praying, giving. And the tradition is to give up something for Lent. A a luxury, perhaps, for 40 days to replicate the sacrifice of Jesus' journey through the desert. As if giving up our daily latte could remotely compare, but, you know, we are who we are. The real call of Lent is not so much about sacrifice as it is about repentance, returning to the Lord. So, repentance. What do we modern people have to repent. You know, we've, we've minimized repentance to just mean, you know, I'm going to feel bad about something I've done. Uh, well, especially if I got caught at it. <laughs> repentance. In the Old Testament, it meant return to God. In the New Testament, the concept is translated as metanoia, which literally means change your mind. In Old Testament times, Returning to God meant to return to the ways of the Torah, the law, the commandments. Israel, like us, had a tendency to wander away from those. The New Testament concept is similar, but there's a a significant upping of the ante. The change that John the Baptist and Jesus call for in the New Testament is an intensification of the Torah. But the significant difference here is that Jesus applies the law to the internal dimensions of the human psyche, to our dispositions, to our emotions, to our thoughts and our desires. 
Jesus emphasizes these over our actions. Jesus' application of the Torah to our internal dispositions can clearly be seen in the Sermon on the Mount. Not only should we not kill, but anger is judged equally as killing. Not only is adultery prohibited, but looking with lust is equally judged. It's not the things that are outside a person that will defile you. It's that which which is within you that will defile you. Jesus extends the meaning of the law to make it a matter of the human heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Create in me a clean heart. Now we're going to sing that a little later. So individually, we all have all sorts of things that we could repent of. You can do your own soul searching as to what those things might be. In a sermon a few weeks ago, I I mentioned that a good way to break down the divisiveness in our culture was to have a deliberate conversation with someone who voted differently. So, being someone who practices what they preach, I did just that this past week. And we chatted for a good 45 minutes or so, and I, I think we both walked away with a better sense of what we have in common. I had to repent to turn around from not being fully open in my professional relationship with my colleague. Today, however, I want to talk about systemic or societal repentance. The Old Testament prophets and Jesus all condemned community or nationwide iniquities. Often it was things like failing to take care of the poor, the refugees, and others but they also condemned the society's abandonment of God-given principles. In our day, this looks like the intertwining of the kingdom of God with the kingdoms of men. In our American context, which is not the only country with this problem, this is called Christian nationalism. This is the sin of believing that our national identity, in our case, our American identity, is inextricable from or is the same as Christianity. First, some distinctions need to be made. Patriotism is the love of country. And this is a good thing, because patriotism helps us appreciate our particular place in God's good creation. We are stewards of this part of God's creation, and we're expected to do the good work of cultivating and improving our part. We can and should love the United States, which also means working to improve it by holding it up for critique when it drifts away from justice for all. That's part of being a good citizen. You know, I love this country, warts and all. We are also Christians. We are Christians first, in fact. We are citizens of the kingdom of God and endeavor to be like Christ in whatever we do and say. We are a part of the body of Christ, which extends across the earth and unites us from every nation and tribe and people and language. We worship Jesus. We have one God. Our commitment to this kingdom transcends, challenges, and affects our worldly loyalties. Christian nationalism blurs the line between patriotism and Christianity. It is a civil religion that puts our earthly citizenship above our obligations as a follower of Christ. And it perverts Christianity and the gospel in at least three ways. The nation, number one, the nation, in our case America, is seen as the way to save human history. 
that we must keep faith in America's destiny, that the U.S. is the hope and the promise for the world. That's kind of a common refrain that echoes that. Except there is only one Savior who will save human history, who is our hope and promise, and that is Jesus. Countries come and go, but Jesus, the Word of God, stands forever. The second perversion of Christian nationalism embraces Satan's third temptation of Jesus to take up the ways of might and power and greatness to save the world. This includes things like trying to pass laws that mandate adherence to Christian culture, such as school-led prayer, or Christian symbols in courtrooms and legislative halls, also adherence to Anglo-Protestant cultural norms, and demanding that people show respect for or revere as sacred national symbols and traditions. This perversion uses tools of intimidation, coercion, and bullying to give Christianity a extra place, a prime place in our national culture, a privileged place. Jesus' tools were justice, mercy, and humility. And those should be our tools as well. The third perversion is that Christian nationalism believes that Christians are being persecuted when they cannot impose their beliefs, their practices, and their traditions on others. This is a perversion because Jesus didn't impose anything. He changed others simply by loving them. Christian nationalism is dangerous because it takes the name of Christ for a worldly political agenda which often embraces racism, white supremacy, patriarchy, militarism, and the separation of those who hold different beliefs. Christian nationalism calls evil good and good evil, to use Martin Luther's phrase. It breeds distrust and fear of non-whites and non-Christians rather than embracing them as fellow children of God. It condones violence and poo-poos the idea that racial inequality exists. It, it opposes humane treatment for refugees instead of welcoming them, as we are told, over and over in the Bible. As Christians... We should be involved in our country's development. Martin Luther says it's our obligation to be good citizens, to extend our Christ-based principles into our work in the community. American Christians worked to end slavery and segregation, and they did it because God requires us to work for justice. And we should be working in our communities and in our governments to advance Christian principles. Christian political engagement, however, is humble, loving, and sacrificial. It is not prideful, hateful, and belligerent. We seek to love our neighbors by promoting religious liberty, fostering racial justice, protecting the rule of law, and honoring constitutional processes. Christian nationalism is easily recognizable by its use of force, division, and authoritarianism, and its justification for violence. Its causes are totally unjust. It proclaims its agenda is the right one for every true believer. This is blasphemy because only the church is authorized to proclaim in the name of Jesus. Christian nationalism purely and simply 
is not Christ-like. It is not Christian. Alexander Solzhenitsyn writes that the line between good and evil does not go between countries or empires or religions or races or political systems. The line between good and evil goes right down the middle of every human heart. Jesus understood that we can either be preoccupied with earthly things, wealth, fame, power, possessions, piety, or, or we could be preoccupied with the treasures of the kingdom of God, generosity, kindness, peacemaking, humility. Jesus calls us to repentance, calls us to return to the kingdom's values. Repentance is the transformation of the human heart where we die to the primacy of the kingdoms of this world to recenter ourselves on the kingdom of God. In baptism, we are plunged beneath the waters of death and returned, recreated into citizens of the kingdom of God. This is the repentance to which Jesus calls us the path of dying to ourself and our understanding of the world, to reorient ourselves to the kingdom of God, to a heart centered in compassion. So where can I, where can we start? We need to start by looking closely at our attitudes about our country and God. We need to be clear about the difference between patriotism and nationalism. And we need to repent of our tendency toward Christian nationalism individually and as a nation. We need to start being intentional about using the tools that Jesus gave us in our conversations. Justice, mercy, and humility. We also need to do this by immediately questioning anybody's call for violence. And that includes verbal violence. We need to do this by listening more and talking less. By taking a moratorium from criticizing anything or anyone and instead make a point of only complimenting or saying nothing. We do this by taking a grudge that we've had against somebody and reconciling it. We do this by checking our anger impulse. Instead of getting angry at someone or something, take a vow to count to 10. And if that's not long enough, try 20 or 30. And that goes for typing a response to somebody on Facebook or posting a meme too. More importantly, we can also do this by looking around every time we're in a group and thinking, what can I give to or say to these other people that will make their day better? These seem simple, hardly important. But if you don't think these little things are important, consider this. How would history be changed if the school gunmen or other mass killers had had compassion shown toward them regularly, if somebody had listened to them, if somebody had refrained from belittling them or walked with them while they were grieving. We don't reorient our hearts all at once. Repentance is not an on and off proposition. It's a series, it's a pattern, it's a rhythm that we live into every day with every person we meet. And so we are challenged each Lent to look at ourselves, to look at our hearts. Where are they focused? On what are they centered? Are we willing to follow the pathway of death 
to our own egos and be resurrected with Christ, with our minds on divine things, our hearts inclined to and centered on a compassion for others so profound that we will set aside everything else, our self, our political party, our time, and our possessions, and bring that compassion into being now and always. May God bless and guide you on your Lenten journey this year. Amen. Restore in us, O God, the splendor of your love. Renew your image in our hearts, and all our sins remove. O Spirit, wake in us. The Let us say together what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy God, in Jesus, your realm, your kingdom has come near to us now and in every place and time. Give your church throughout the world a spirit of humility and repentance. Teach us to trust always in the good news of your salvation. You have made a covenant of mercy with every living creature. Protect all the earth's creatures from destruction empower the work of biologists, conservationists, and science educators. Rise up like incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. All your paths are steadfast love and faithfulness. Direct the words and actions of leaders in our community, in our nation, and throughout the world, that they may, they may maintain justice for the lowly. Even in the wilderness, you are with us. Walk alongside migrants and refugees crossing dangerous lands. Tend to those whose lives feel desolate. Give healing and strength to all who suffer. Let my prayer rise up like incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you.
In the covenant of baptism, you claim us as beloved children. Nurture us in our baptismal identity and teach us to live within it for the sake of others. Strengthen our congregation's ministries of care and concern. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Merciful God, receive the sacrifice of our praise and thanksgiving and the offering of our lives, that following on the way of the cross, we may know the joy of the resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also, and also with, with you. you. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give, give our, our thanks, thanks and, and praise. praise. Let us pray. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus the Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, and then he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. So with this bread and this cup, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the bread. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us and send us forth burning with justice, peace, and love. Let's join now in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Return to God with all your heart. Receive bread for the journey and drink for the desert. Behold who you are and become what you will receive. Now, if you are 
uh, as you are gathered around uh, the computer or television, whatever you're watching on, uh, please take your bread and wine and uh, take the bread, give it to someone nearby or take it yourself and say, this is the body of Christ given for you. Then in the same manner, take your wine or juice and say, this cup is the blood of Christ is shed for you. Adam, the body of Christ is given for you. Amen. The blood of Christ is shed for you. Amen. Paul, the body of Christ given for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Receive the blessing. As you go on your way, may Christ go with you. May he go before you to show you the way. May he go behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over, and within you to give you peace. Amen. Amen. And now, marked with the cross of Christ, let us go forth to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. To God. Jesus Christ.